so if there's anyone here who's open to doing uh, a presentation, a little blurb, it's a very casual environment. Uh, we're not professional speakers by any means. Uh, we don't expect anyone to. It's just a bunch of people getting together, talking about similar interests and learning something new. So if there's anyone here, you know, feel free to message me on the meetup group and we're happy to, you know, get something set up and <clears throat> so if there's anyone in here interested. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty fun time. So just let me know. Hit me up. We've been trying to do it monthly um, and we've had a pretty good cadence uh, of, I think since April. Um, we were able to do two of them in June because we had some people in town. So um, that's our kind of commitment. Uh, we sent out a survey at one point to ask direction. Um, we got a lot of feedback that we wanted to do more uh, S, uh, DevOps was the generic term, but um, so more automation, things like that. So we're trying to find people who want to come in and demo technology. We're not, um, doesn't have to be a full-blown presentation, although that does help. Um, I think people really like demos and being able to ask questions and see how real life examples play out by all means. Um, stop and ask questions as you go through it. So, um, and if you have any feedback at the end, uh, let us let us know. We're we're in it to make it better for for all of you. Um, this is Peter Grace. So Peter is uh, out of uh, Philadelphia. Outskirts Philadelphia. Outskirts <laughs> Philadelphia. Um, he's a, a senior consultant with Tenth Magnitude. Uh, Peter runs a on his own time. He runs a school internally of Tenth Magnitude. Uh, around the DevOps and SR site reliability practices um, to kind of help uh, everybody get a level set. Um, so we had a person who was scheduled to have, uh, do a talk, cancel, reach out to Peter. He's coming in town anyway um, and see if he could take one of his schools and apply it to this. And so that's how we came to be. So we'll go ahead and get started. Awesome. <clears throat> well, welcome everybody and thanks for coming. Um, uh, Casey uh, did pretty much most of the introduction that I was going to do. Sorry, but, you can uh, do it again. Yeah, I'll just go all again for, uh, for this entire um, Topic we're going to discuss today is Kubernetes RBAC, as you probably heard about in the invite. Maybe as boring as it sounds, the reason why that's the subtitle for this is A, I really couldn't come up with a great title for this presentation, and B, it is kind of dry material, but judging by the fact that you're here, I think that we've overcome the fact that it's dry and we can keep uh, moving forward with uh, actually uh, getting things done. I think I'm curious about something. I'll just go away. Let's see here. Just a sec. Oh, okay. Sorry, I don't know why that's happening. Yeah, I mean, we'll just close out of Teams, and that should solve the issue. No, no, it doesn't. It will just really seriously bother me. Oh, you know what? So, Here. Uh, is it okay button there? Awesome. All right, teamwork. Awesome. Teamwork makes the dream work. All right, so. Um, as Casey mentioned, I'm Peter Grace. I work at 10th Magnitude here as a senior automation engineer, which means that in my day-to-day -day, uh, work, I'm primarily doing things with technologies like Terraform, Kubernetes, um, helping companies uh, work with Azure DevOps, and uh, just bringing it all together because the technologies, um, it's, it's you know, systems administration and site reliability is an ecosystem. You know, we think of systems administration, a lot of people think of, oh, it's computer systems. No, it's the whole ecosystem of the things that we're working on. Um, and this topic actually has a bit of uh, cross-pollination in that regard as well, because uh, Kubernetes on its own does not make for an RBAC system. We're going to get into that a bit more. Um, <clears throat> the As uh, Casey mentioned, I run the School of SRE here in our, our organization. Essentially, an hour a week, we get together. I get the, a bunch of the, the consultants who want to learn more about a particular technology, and we just jam on that technology for an hour. Usually, it's a, just you know, sitting in a command line, and I'll say, all right, what are we doing now? And we just we make it happen. We, we, we go through the steps, and, and people learn through that. Um, unfortunately, this topic is rather 
um, difficult to demo because it requires a lot of prerequisite setup uh, items to make work nicely, especially when we're talking about marrying Azure AD and Kubernetes together. So I don't know whether or not we're going to have time to have actual practical uh, lab demo, but I'm hoping that what I cover through our, our, the lecture part of this will at least uh, give us enough information that we can go back and, and play on our own time. Um, this topic specifically was picked because uh, a member of the School of SRE said that he really wished that he could have an entire hour devoted to Kubernetes RBAC. So without further ado, um, so I a question that I do have, I guess, that, you know, a bit of a, a level set is, uh, let's see here, I can just click or look. Oh no, my clicker died. There we go. All right, so. <clears throat> Before I go much further, I kind of just want to get a gauge of the room of how much people know about particular technologies. Um, with a show of hands, and I know I'm not going to get the Teams people to raise their hand through the thing there, but uh, who here already has experience with RBAC technologies? Minimal. Minimal, okay. And who here uh, works with Kubernetes daily? Okay, so, so a small number, this is good. Um, how many of you are pretty versed in how Azure AD works. Okay, a fair, fair bit more. And finally, who here knows this topic already and is here to heckle? I would expect, uh, uh, unfortunately, the one guy who joined to heckle me has uh, had to drop off, but. All right, so we can go through the slides at a nice uh, leisurely pace and I don't have to skip a whole bunch of them uh, because it will just bore the heck out of everyone. Um, so what is role-based access control? So. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia and uh, look up this topic, there's a whole lot of super dry information about this. I went through and I read that page top to bottom, and I think I distilled the best like t clinical definition of what RBAC is. So it's a security concept designed to restrict system access to only authorized users. Uh, and those users have certain roles that are applied to their account. Roles are in turn given certain access levels, ensuring that the people who need access have access. Uh, subjects, in turn, which are the, the, the users in most cases, but not always, subjects are given roles that enable permissions. The basic like tenets of RBAC are is that a subject can only do a permission if the subject has been assigned a role. So if we're talking about a user, a user will be assigned to a role, and that role will be given permissions, and that will enable the, the authentication chain for what that person is doing. Uh, and so, as mentioned, a role must be configured to allow access to the resource via permission, and a permission cannot be executed if a role does not allow it. Um, uh, right around this point, when I've talked in the past about this, people have said, oh, roles, they're users, they're groups. You know, not necessarily. Roles are not specifically groups, although you can assign roles to groups, but they are two different constructs. Um, a subject, however, can be a group or a user. You would assign a role to a group, so a group is technically a subject. Are, are, these, are, are these internal policies or are these policies based on the administra network administration? So um, when you're setting up, uh, so if we were talking about like a large company, there would be a security team that would say, this, this team can uh, have read access to this particular data. And this other team has read and write access to it. And it's the specification of these people can do this much, but no further, or this team is the operations team and has the keys to everything essentially. But in a large company that would be done by the security team. In a smaller company, you may just wind up giving everyone cluster admin and hope for the best and uh, you know, so have that issue come up later when you have to grow to a point where people actually care who has access to it. Okay. Um, so, there are three levels of RBAC uh, by the NIST's definition, and here's where things get kind of even weirder to explain. Uh, core RBAC is uh, as simple as it sounds, everything that I've just explained here. Hierarchical RBAC is uh, um, the concept of a role can inherit the permissions from another role. So if, we, if you have, uh, if you add uh, um, role A as a member of role B, then role B can do everything that role B is allowed plus all of what A is allowed. So this is similar to uh, how AD works currently. You can add groups to another group and then the, the, the permissions are, are uh, a treat out. There's also constrained RBAC, which is a specific type of RBAC that enables things like a separation of duties. 
where you might have uh, um, uh, a particular people on a team who have an access, whereas the other people on the team don't. And then it's uh, um, it's it's a bit more nuanced in its definition. It's a little hard to to show without an example of how it works there. Uh, but it's just suffice to say. Most people wind up using something like a hierarchical RBAC in normal operation, though sometimes when you have situations like PCI glass houses and other things, you might require more uh, RBAC than, uh, than you know, the, like the easy mode RBAC that we're talking about right here. <clears throat> so I think we all kind of know what Kubernetes is, but I'm going to go ahead and go through this, uh, these uh, steps here because uh, they're relevant to the rest of the slides. Uh, Kubernetes is a container orchest orchestration platform. Uh, containers obviously are, are a, the hot new way of running apps in segregated uh, namespaces so that uh, there is a separation of memory space, network, uh, disk operations, etc. Um, I like to joke that it, one of my prior jobs, one of the main reasons we started using uh, Kubernetes is because nobody wanted Node.js installed on servers. And so we ins just instead of put Node.js in containers so that it wouldn't infect the rest of the machine. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I guess that's a little digression. Um, Kubernetes in general uses, util utilizes Docker technology to run containers on hosts. They are working on alternative container methodologies for uh, Kubernetes. But generally, when you hear Kubernetes, you can assume, at least for the next year or two, Docker. Um, the standard, the standard work unit of work in, in uh, Kubernetes is the pod, which is a set of one or more containers that are doing a job. Uh, and if you have uh, multiple containers in a single pod, they can talk to each other. They share the same namespaces. Uh, in that operational space. So then like you can have something like a Prometheus exporter running sidecar to a main container in, uh, in a pod, and then they can talk to the app directly without any extra magic. Um, pods in turn can be deployed at the behest of deployments, stateful sets, daemon sets, and jobs, which are kind of higher level um, uh, abstractions of um, creating work. Um, it has the concept of namespaces, which is important, where workloads can be separated into distinct categories. For instance, if you wanted to uh, have a, a dev and acceptance uh, stage prod environment, you could use separate namespaces to differentiate those. However, most people just go the route of having different clusters for those, those goals. However, you could have a dev cluster and your namespaces were assigned by team, so like a team could deploy to this one particular namespace and, uh, and and do the things they need to do in that environment. The namespace is just a way of containing those deployment stateful sets, data sets, and jobs into one logical um, organizational unit, I suppose you could say. Kubernetes does have the concept of users, groups, and service accounts, which is you know pretty much in terms of what we're uh, talking about in this presentation. And those in turn can be given roles which enable permissions. <clears throat> so tying it together with uh, our back in Kubernetes, when we are making roles in Kubernetes, we create a role or a cluster role object. Now, um, cluster roles are cluster-wide permissions. So if you apply a cluster role uh, to a subject via a cluster role binding, it will apply to everything across all namespaces. Uh, normal just roles and role bindings are a namespace scope. So you specify what namespace you put it in, and that role only applies in that namespace. <clears throat> so as an example of what a role would look like, this I actually pulled this from uh, my, my Kubernetes cluster at home uh, with my Jenkins uh, install. Um, so the... Um, the important part to understand about a role is it's broken down into a set of rules. And here's an example of the rules. Can you guys see this in the back pretty well? Okay. So um, in a, a role rule, you set, it's an array, so you can have multiple of these. And you can set um, one or more API groups, which are constructs in Kubernetes that specify what uh, part of Kubernetes you're, act, uh, you're actually using. There's um, app extensions, and uh, also you can create more API groups with something called custom resource definitions, which is a bit out of scope of what we're talking about. But suffice to say, API groups normally will be app extensions 
or some other string that's specified by the developers, or you can just leave it blank to apply to everything. Uh, you can specify the different resources that it applies to. So in this case here, I've got a, a, a role that's giving uh, create, delete, get, list, patch, update, watch to pods. So what this means is that this particular role, when it's assigned to a subject, it can do all of these operations to a pod. Other resources include things like services, which handle the connection of a container to, uh, to networking, um, a deployment, um, stateful sets, daemon sets, the things I covered before, which are higher level abstractions that create pods through replica sets. So um, it's, it's pretty simple here. This stuff up top is just you know um, annotation metadata that's part of my deployment pipeline. So it's not really that uh, relevant here. Um, the the potatoes of what's important here is uh, in this rules environment. So <clears throat> the it's important to notice that, as I mentioned, the verbs, the the permissions that can be given are rather rudimentary in this case, and and they are they're necessarily so because Kubernetes is not trying to know deeply what's going on with the internals of your pod or your application. It's not, this, this is not a way of setting application R back. It's more or less setting up access at the Kubernetes level. So you're going to have uh, your common things like CRUD, patch and watch, uh, uh, rather than like uh, login or access file system or things like that. That's not what, what this is really designed for. Um, let's see, so, we created a role in the previous slide. Here is a cluster role. So this uh, cluster role, uh, it, when applied in a cluster role binding, would give the subject that is the uh, topic of this cluster role access to read all of the secrets in Kubernetes. Now, you probably don't actually want to give this access at cluster level to an actual user because then they have the keys to the kingdom to read all of your secrets. But this is an example of, uh, of a way to uh, create that at the cluster level. Uh, so I mentioned uh, cluster role bindings and role bindings. The, um, in, this, in this example role binding, we're taking a role that we've created and we're assigning it to a subject. In this case, it's a user called Dave. Uh, and because this is a role binding and not a cluster role binding, it has a namespace and it will only apply to the development namespace. Now, because this is a role binding, you may have noticed that we're including a cluster role. This is valid, but it still will mean only to this namespace because the role binding is namespace based and it's not global to the cluster. So, Kubernetes couldn't know about this even if it tried because it's not part of the global scope. <clears throat> but this is one way of uh, um, uh, cheating, I suppose. If you wanted to make a set of uh, um, roles in your environment, but you didn't want to make separate cluster role versus regular roles, you could create them as cluster roles, but then make them in a role binding and save yourself double entry of roles versus cluster roles. It may not pass muster with your security team, but that's, you know, if you're setting up your test cluster to, to fiddle with it, it's really not that big a deal. <clears throat> so as a same idea as uh, the role binding and cluster role binding, we have a similar uh, layout here. And uh, the because it's a cluster role binding, it doesn't have a namespace assigned to it, and it's just, it will work in any namespace. <clears throat> okay, so I mentioned several slides back, uh, you know, so that Kubernetes has uh, service accounts. Um, Kubernetes service accounts uh, can be automatically created for pods when they execute, and uh, they, when the pod runs, it has a service account assigned to it which is the subject that is used to decide what resources or what accesses that pod has into the system. So for instance, if you've ever tried to install Helm and gave it a separate service account name, but didn't set the right RBAC for it, Helm wouldn't work because it didn't have access to create resources in the cluster because the service account wasn't properly allowed to do that. Um, so, you can create your own service accounts and then create roles that uh, reference them. Um, the, but as I mentioned here, the larger topic of using service accounts is kind of uh, a whole different topic. Uh, 
Um, but roughly in any places where you can specify a subject, you can specify a service account name in the form of system colon service account colon namespace colon name or via the YAML that I'm going to show here in the next slide. <clears throat> so this is an example of poor security practice. Again, this is from my home cluster. So I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and cop to this. Um, I have a cluster role binding for Tiller, which is the Helm service account. And I'm giving it cluster admin, which is the keys to the kingdom, because why not? I like to live dangerously. But then while I was trying to make my uh, Kubernetes uh, agent in Jenkins work right, it didn't have access either. So I just went ahead and added the Jenkins default service account, for, or the, the service account default from namespace Jenkins to this uh, cluster role binding. Now, the problem with doing this is, is that the default service account is shared in other pods. So anyone who has access to deploy a pod in the namespace Jenkins could make that pod in turn change anything in my Kubernetes cluster. So it's important to keep, a, keep in mind that things like cluster admin is like giving root to stuff. You really don't want to do that unless you're, you really know what you're doing. Um, but again, if you're just fiddling around, then things like Tiller, it's much easier to just give it the cluster admin than uh, um, go through and set up all of the individual roles and RBAC items. <clears throat> so yeah, bad Pete. So all this is great, but how do I add users and groups to Kubernetes, which is a question that I have gotten several times when I've talked about RBAC in the past. And the uh, fun answer is you don't. You don't add, add the users to Kubernetes. Kubernetes, uh, with, with Kubernetes, auth authentication is a bolt-on. It doesn't come turnkey. So by default, Kubernetes has a webhook-based token system, which is how you can interface with uh, the cluster via kubectl uh, in a normal install. You'll notice if you look at the kubeconfig file on your machine, it has the, the certs that it trusts, and then there's a token field that's base64 encoded, which is the token that enables it to authenticate to the API server to do, uh, do the needful, essentially, on that, uh, on that cluster. But there are other ways to get access to that, which is what the where we're getting to the meat and potatoes here. Um, Base, uh, base Kubernetes, if you install bare metal Kubernetes, you're not going to be able to do uh, uh, Azure AD with it by default. Uh, luckily, you can provision an AKS cluster directly from the AZ CLI with the proper, when you specify the proper settings, of course, it will automatically enable Azure AD so that your users can then authenticate to that cluster. Um, I put in a, a URL, URL here down at the bottom for the docs that I've taken some screenshots from in the next slides. Uh, it's, it's a rather long page, and to go through all of the processes to do a demo would probably take us a rather long time, so we may not uh, actually do any of it. But if you want to uh, have a, a source to look at for that, that would be the URL for that. Um, of course, uh, so as I mentioned here, with um, setting up Azure AKS with uh, Azure AD integration, um, you need to have two uh, app uh, app accounts, app app services. Um, one is the uh, the server level app service that it uses to do global group and user uh, um, uh, ownership, I guess, or or attendance. The, the what group is this user in? And that particular um, uh, account needs to have special permissions, special delegated permissions, uh, like directory read all and user read. Um, one thing that if, if you've gone through these steps and you set it all up the way that the website says, but then it just doesn't work right, the number one thing I've found is, is that uh, if you use the search in pr uh, permissions and search for directory read all, there's actually two different uh, uh, sub uh, categories that will allow that, uh, that, that permission. However, if you choose the one that is not Microsoft.graph, it will not work. And we've lost a lot of time with people going, oh, I set it up right. And we look and, oh, yeah, it looks great. And then we realize, oh, it's not actually Microsoft.graph. It's the deprecated Azure Active Directory client read API or whatever. So long story short, setting up the delegated permissions, make sure it's the Microsoft Graph API as opposed to any of the others. Um, and likewise, there's also a client um, app ID that's generated 
that uh, is not given any special permissions. And what it's used for is the carrier to take the user's um, uh, authentication request to Azure to make the authentication call. So when, uh, if you've seen uh, demos of it in the past, when you, the first time you run the kubectl command, it'll bring up a line that says, please log in to aka.ms slash device login with this code to authenticate. What's happening is, is that when you've run that kubectl command, the, uh, the, the kubectl command has said, hey, I need to uh, um, authenticate in. It gives you back a token code. You go into the website. Azure then takes that code and says, okay, this logged in user is this user principal in AD. Send that back to Kubernetes, and then it now knows that this particular session is bound to this role. Or, the, or rather, this subject in the RPAC. Um, yeah, so this is the command line, or what it would in general look like for uh, creating an AKS cluster with uh, Azure AD auth uh, integrated. If you don't have those uh, dash dash AAD entries in there, it will not work. It will not uh, turn on the Azure AD secret sauce, and uh, it is not turn. You cannot turn it on after you've provisioned. So you have to make sure you create that cluster with those Azure AD uh, settings uh, to begin with, at least as far as I know. I could be wrong. You can correct me if I'm wrong there. But I'm pretty sure it has to be done at the time of the cluster creation. <clears throat> so to more, more readily explain how one would add a, uh, a Azure AD user into Kubernetes RBAC, well, you can use, in the case of users, you can use the user principal name, which for me here at 1092, pgrace at 1092.com. You can also use the object ID for that user in Azure AD instead. Uh, in the case of groups, you can only use the object ID. It will not let you use a, 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 a display name, essentially, for that group. You have to use the uh, that object. So when you have run this command here to create the cluster and when between five and three days have uh, occurred uh, the machine says oh your AKS cluster is ready I joke because I've had an, a provision going for five days on a, a AKS cluster before and before I finally controlled see it so um, it, it happens sometimes just just restart it it'll be fine um, the first time you try to log in to that cluster you're, well, first off, you're not going to have a kube config file for that cluster yet. Uh, and so if you um, run this command line, azaks get credentials with the proper resource group and name of your cluster, and dash dash admin, it will download the admin token for the cluster. And that will allow you to interface with the cluster without having to do the Azure AD login process. The reason why we have to do this is because you have to be able to set up the RBAC on the system before you can actually use the Azure AD to log in appropriately. So the dash dash admin there is the secret sauce that allows you to log in that first time. <clears throat> I've uh, run into some clients who just say, oh, just use dash dash admin all the time when you're trying to get your credentials, which defeats the entire purpose of, uh, of doing RBAC, but uh, hey, you know, it, uh, it is what it is. Um, so as I say, the critical thing here is the dash dash admin. <clears throat> so once uh, you have set up the RBAC, uh, appropriately as the, uh, the screenshot had shown um, when that user attempts to do the thing that uh, that you have allowed so in this case here in this command line I'm doing get nodes which means that in the background my user has to have a role that enables uh, read and list on uh, node objects so as long as the user has those uh, credentials well technically, they will run this command. They'll get that, me that message to, hey, enter in this rando code to authenticate. And if they, uh, if their user is properly set up in Kubernetes RBAC, they'll either get the response to the command or they'll get a 401 not authorized uh, if they're not allowed to do it. So yeah, so at this point, I was thinking, oh, yeah, great, we'd have a demo of this. And then I started trying to get Azure AD working, and I was trying, like, trying to get into a, a, this environment. Um, I can definitely show some of the, uh, the configuration settings if you guys want, but I think that really the best thing would be to just check out that Microsoft web page that has all of the steps nicely uh, laid out. 
Um, so I would say that uh, we can definitely do some questions, but first I wanted to also say that uh, we're hiring here. So if you're interested in doing Kubernetes and other uh, uh, SRE-like technologies, you can go to our magic URL there and find out all about the cool stuff that we are doing. Uh, so questions. Yes, sir. If you're doing on-prem or mini cube, what would be a way to manage like users, given that there's no user? Uh, there are providers available that will let you do things with LDAP, uh, with eDirectory. Uh, there's uh, there's ways to bolt on alternatives, and you'd have to look up that particular stuff. But I do know for a fact that there is an LDAP provider. So if you have like local LDAP in your environment, um, if you if you use a technology such as Rancher. Uh, Rancher has its own authentication piece built into it that it then bolts into the RBAC subsystem. So if you're in the Rancher uh, Kubernetes UI and add a user, it transparently goes to the API and sets up the RBAC for those particular users. So, yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Is there anything specific from what I've uh, talked about here that you want to uh, C, I suppose. I don't have a, a, a stood up cluster, but we can take the rest of the time and try to get it set up. But it's going to be a whole lot of watching me type SIDS in, which is not much fun. Question for you, though. Yeah. So, with Kubis, do you, what's the recommended path you would probably take between talking to clients and breaking out between a production and development? Because DevOps is a big, very big part of that. You're usually, your production environment's going to have policies locking you down, so there's no changes. Usually when that's built, that's set in stone. So you're not going to be able to kind of do anything with that. Mm -hmm. But dev becomes a whole different world because it's basically there for development. Right. So what would you recommend in regards to clients when you're working and saying, hey, we, we're freshly getting into it. We're trying to use Kubis and we we want to set a solid DevOps environment for it. Mm -hmm. What's your recommendation in regards to deployment, tying in with the RBACs and locking it down so that nobody goes in there and breaks something severely for everybody else? Uh, well, it, it definitely would uh, um, depend on the client and their um, uh, tolerance for security. There's there's really two sides to the equation. You could do a situation where it's a free for all in dev and everyone has access to everything, and then production is very heavily clamped down. But your developers, if they are, in, if you're in an environment where your developers readily log into prod to fix things. Well, first off, they shouldn't be doing that. But if they are, because I mean, we're talking about the real world here, they may get used to having access in dev that they don't have in production, and that may slow the resolution process of an issue. So a better way to go might be to have dev being free for all, stage being a mirror of prods are back, so that if you're trying to fix a problem in stage, you run into those same issues so that you're familiar with the differences between the access that you have available. Because it's more likely you'd have a developer that has to jump on stage to look at an issue that they couldn't reproduce in, in dev. Um, but if you're in an environment that's already heavily stratified with uh, security policies, they probably don't, it's probably not even a, a question to them. They're, everything that, that you interact with is heavily locked down and that's, you know, go pound sand if you don't, uh, if you don't like what we're talking about here. Um, but in, in like a five person shop, you're going to wind up having a situation where everyone's going to have cluster admin. It's just going to be, it's going to have to be meet space controls and not RBAC that stops people from taking the system down. So if that's the case, what would you probably recommend in regards to the ideas of RBAC policies? Because you can create custom, you know, mm -hmm. RBACs. So if you were looking at that, obviously, you would you grade it out? Basically, have different tiers or whatever you want to call it, grades, mm -hmm. tiers mm -hmm. for RBAC policies with abilities to write, create, edit, push, and anything else like that. So, mm -hmm. what's I would, your approach? I would say that uh, in in an environment such as that, uh, you would have uh, namespace level uh, RBACs so that. Uh, a person would have uh, all the access they need inside of a particular namespace, but then not have access in the other namespaces. So if you're in, in, a, in a small shop, you would probably have more likely a larger cluster with everyone using the same cluster for multiple uses, rather than having a bunch of randomly provisioned AKS clusters, which is more more apparent in larger corporations where there's just like, right. there's 10 different subscriptions and everyone's doing everything in Azure to, you know, it's kind of, you know, at some point, no nobody can watch the whole system anymore, and so it's like right. a lot of shadow IT going on. Um, the 
in situations where you do have tight control over it, setting namespace level uh, permissions and having a clear differentiation between this is the development namespace, this is like the operational namespace, and there's things that, that don't you don't touch over the wall helps with that. But as for a basic level, the things that you need to do in Kubernetes, like creating resources, destroying resources, all that, you're going to need to have access to those in the dev environment because you're going to be creating and deleting as you're making new deployments and mm -hmm. things of that nature. Unless everyone's super into the idea of using CI CD pipelines, in which case you can just have it so that everything's deployed by a CI CD and the end user, the developers don't even have to interact with the Kubernetes cluster, um, which is kind of the I guess the DevOps dream state is that, uh, of course, you don't have to talk to the cluster. It was all tested locally in Docker containers, and it works right, so you know it shouldn't be an issue. Um, unfortunately, the you know the 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 golden the golden image, the golden state, is not what we work in day in and day out. So uh, it's it's really a, a case by case basis. But I would say, in the dev environments, leaning more towards getting the users ready for how tight the permissions will be sooner is probably better. So uh, a common problem with RBAC is when you um, you get the, the permission denied error or some generic permission denied error. Um, and do you have any strategies for <clears throat> getting <clears throat> getting a sense of what all of the roles um, and objects, what their permissions are set at and kind of what role you might need to set to a specific object? Mm -hmm. uh, any tools or, or like um, who control options that would um, provide some visibility into like the whole cluster um, state mm -hmm. uh, so you can like properly set those permissions or were it to be so simple <laughs> um, the the nice thing is is that kubectl commands are mostly uh, self-documenting in the in the permissions they're going to need so for instance if you're doing a get you're going to need to have read access for the items and and I, I think it's read and list um, if you want to edit, you're going to need to have the update permission. If you want to delete, you're going to need the delete permission. And then the next, the, the subject of your verb is going to be the resource that you can do. So it's kind of a one-to-one -one mapping. So the resources in that one slide where we were talking about, you know, nodes are the same thing in that RBAC as they are in this command. So uh, it would be difficult to find a random weird permission that the person didn't have that made everything not work. That being said, if people get in the habit of using dash dash all namespaces, when they look like kubectl get pods dash dash all namespaces, if the user does not have a cluster role enabling global view of pods or, or any of the, that particular resource, it will flat fail. It won't, even, it won't just give you the things you have access to. It will just say you can't list the entire cluster scope. I uh, know it, it will say 401 not authorized, but the answer is is that you tried to use all namespaces and you don't have a cluster role for it. So the follow up on his question then, would it make more prudent if you're architecting, you're kind of building this out, let's say ground level, you're kind of getting into it, then to turn around and start looking at mappings in regards to give it permissions based upon what you're going to be doing. I mean, excuse me, what Kubis is going to be doing and based on tying that to the RBAC requirements of the rules of what I mean, excuse me, the rules are going to be needed in the, in the perms. Mm -hmm. So, it, or is it just because here's the other thing I know that in, in Azure, you're going to have pre built in default roles that you can actually use. Microsoft says, hey, these are a ton of them that all work and they're perfect. Um, and sometimes they don't, or sometimes it's restrictive and it's basically on a deprecated object that's causing you all your problems that's giving your 401. Right. Is that something you see or with the direction be to kind of just test and evaluate or base it upon what you need to do? Because like you said, everybody's going in and doing dash dash admin. It does make a difference then. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I would say that uh, we're not, everything's really in flux right now in Kubernetes. Even things are starting to solidify. It's way better than it was in sub 1.0. Yeah. Um, but there are APIs changing, which means the API groups might change, things like that. And it will be kind of a constant target to set up yeah. the, the, the RBAC for things going forward. And it may be that what you set today may not work at the next release coming out in two months or whatever. But uh, that being said, there are kind of like rules of thumb where um, you may not care whether or not a person can list all pods across all namespaces. 
uh, they may not get, be able to get relevant information. But the downside is if they have access to uh, list all pods, they also have the ability to iterate through the uh, the environment variables past those pods, which may have passwords in them or things like mm -hmm. that because of the, the 12, 12 guiding principles thing. If you put... Uh, uh, if you can pass something like a password in through a environment variable, it's better than hard coding it into right. the system. Although most people who are using Kubernetes will use Kubernetes secrets for that as opposed to an environment variable, but it's a stepped process of getting people to adopt those technologies. So there may be some bad practices that sneak in with your environment as people are deploying it. But, you know, for instance, being able to, to describe the node like all the nodes in the cluster, there's not really very much information that, uh, that that would be a security concern for a security auditor uh, in that regard. So you could set a baseline cluster role binding that said every user has access to describe all nodes or something like that. Uh, and, and then go from there, say, in my environment, what is okay for everyone to look at and then work your way down? Um, by default, Kubernetes ships with a base set of RBAC, but nobody's actually added to it. So your admin user has access to everything because that user's token has cluster admin. But if you were to create a new token to log in uh, to the environment via like a service account or whatnot, the new service account would have no permissions until it was given to it. And the only caveat and asterisk there is that if a pod's created and it doesn't have a service account, Kubernetes handles creating it and gives it the basic amount of required, like permissions required to do its work in that pod. Uh, I hope I'm, I'm getting to the meat of what your question is. No, 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 you, you are. And I, I think this part of the thing is so like, I mean, I was just reading up on yesterday and, and Microsoft just released something, I think just this past month in June or maybe July. Mm -hmm. I know it said JU something 2019. So I'm assuming it's the last month or two mm -hmm. where they were just talking about like their new revision to Kubis. And it's just about everything that, you know, they've been able to do. And it's a mountain of documentation to read through to kind of understand it. Well, I know a lot of it just comes to the practical, putting it into your environment and kind of understanding right. how it's going to work and based upon what your needs are. Because, I mean, one thing, too, is tied into automation on the other side of it, So, which is orchestrating all of that in regards to everything that's being built. Right. Destroyed. Microsoft's kind of in a tough spot because um, if you change how core Kubernetes works, too much, right. then people have to relearn a new technology. Yep. But core Kubernetes wasn't really built with the concepts that Azure wants to apply to it. And so that's why they're kind of adding these uh, extra little um, bits and pieces to it to try and make that integration better. But they do have an, uh, like a, a feeling of jankiness to them um, because of the fact that they're not actually built into Kubernetes. Right. They're, they're like bolted on on the side. And to be fair to Microsoft, AWS has the same problem with EKS. They have a um, IAM authenticator that uses the AWS IAM process to do the same stuff we're talking about here, except instead of uh, like a user principal name for AD, you put in that the long uh, URN of uh, the AWS user in instead. And if that, the way that works is, is there's a pod running in Kubernetes that proxies the auth request in AWS. And if that pod is malfunctioning, nobody can log into the cluster. Mm -hmm. So it's like these are these are, are, are problems that I don't like. I think that somebody in Google HQ is just like, how would I write this if I if it, I only cared about how Google does it? Mm -hmm. And that's that's essentially how that that worked because of the the, the beginnings of Kubernetes as being. Uh, the spiritual successor to Borg, which was a Google product that they used internally for many years, it did similar things to Kubernetes. They took a lot of that concepts that they, they had in Borg and just put them in Kubernetes. So I think that that will change steadily as more companies start putting more into the, uh, the ecosystem as well and uh, becoming core committers to the Kubernetes uh, um, uh, repos and, and adding their unique flair. The downside is, is that more cooks in the kitchen mean that there's probably going to be more wrangling for what's the one right way to do this this process. So, you know, Microsoft's doing the best. I guess TLDR is Microsoft's doing the best that they can with the thing that they've been given, which is not very uh, easy for them to bolt what they want onto. Yes. Yes. So if um if there's no concept of users in Kubernetes itself. How do you attach the um, 
the cluster the role bindings to to user like is that are they come do they come in as like CRDs or do you um, like when Azure brings its own plugin mm -hmm. or is it there's just some house certificates or like so the way that uh, so the way that uh, um, the authentication works in Azure as far as I'm aware and I'm not 100 certain so I may be talking completely out of my ass with this one but the um, there are no auth proxies running in the cluster like there are in AWS. So my guess is, is that at the master level, which is like kind of a shadow part of your Kubernetes cluster, they're running some kind of integration glue that gets gets Kubernetes. So essentially, this is just a like a text file that Kubernetes references. What happens is, is that when that auth request comes in and it's me saying I want to do kubeco get nodes, when uh, I go to that URL and put that code in, uh, by virtue of me doing that in my already authenticated browser, Azure then sends back to the Kubernetes cluster that uh, UPN pgrace of 10magnitude.com just logged in. <coughs> Kubernetes then checks its flat file of, oh, it's pgrace of 10magnitude.com. He's allowed to do that. Boom, he now has access to um, cluster admin. Okay, so that does something's monitoring, like some controllers monitoring that mm -hmm. on the Azure or AWS site. Right, and that, that's uh, how those two app IDs I was talking about play in. The, the client app ID is used to make that Azure auth call, but then there's a server ID that has more uh, permissions that can then iterate through the user account that just logged in to find out what groups, because I may be a, a, a member of this group, like as, you know, Joe Schmo, John Q. Public at tedmagnitude.com. If I'm a member of this group, I'll still get access to it because the the the, the glue that is is hidden from us says, oh, John Q. Public at tedmagnitude.com is a member of this group with this object ID, and the flat files looked at and it goes, oh yeah, that that object ID is allowed. So uh, that's that's really the, the 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 big cognitive dissonance thing is is that. You expect with something like Kubernetes that like this is doing something more than just being like a reference file. But when you when you break Kubernetes down, it it's in and of itself is a bunch of controllers that render text files into things. So like, it kind of goes with what core Kubernetes actually is. But it's kind of a, a mind blown for uh, for a lot of people when they first like make that that connection of oh the the a pod emission controller just reads what the pod specs are from etcd and then creates these pods you know so it's a, a similar uh, issue uh, but i'm going a little little deep into the the, the muck for kubernetes there <laughs> any other questions cool you know well i know I, mean, I do i just don't want to be the guy who just keeps on rambling away um i mean i take it when i saw the group of hands there wasn't a lot of people who actually had a lot of hands on mm -hmm. Is there a, I know going into a demo of building out Kubis is mm -hmm. one thing. Would it be easier to show an overlay in regards to understanding the master cluster and all the pods and reference in regards to when we talk about rights in regards to how that communication goes back and forth? I know Microsoft Docs, they have like the Visios and the diagrams. I don't know if there is an easy way to kind of visualize and reference that kind of give everybody a, a visual sense of regards to how things are kind of interconnected. Well, I do happen to have a uh, demo cluster that I use for School of SRE anyway. So okay. we, could absolutely, yeah, we could absolutely pivot this into Kubernetes 101. Uh, just what time is it? 6.30. We have a bit of time, so I can kind of abbreviatedly run yeah, cause I think Kubernetes 101. The one big thing from a visual reference is just to understand when you, you know, like to take those key points that you're talking about in regards to the access level, in regards to the subjects and the roles, and then the permissions given underneath them to see how they kind of feed up and then mm -hmm. feed down the tree. Right. If you guys want, I will go ahead. I'm and sorry, guys. I'm not no. trying to <laughs> openly assume for everybody. Let's see, let's see what we can see here. Get a find my cluster. All right. So, so as I mentioned, we do a school of SRE in, uh, in uh, 10 magnitude here. And so what I do is I deploy um, random projects. The previous project that uh, we were working on was uh, how how a end user would deploy WordPress in a cluster. So there's a bunch of stuff in the, in the cluster about that. But let me just bring up by, no, not lock my screen. I wanted to find my, so 
this over this way. Let's see if I can kick up that font a bit. Uh, all right. So, so this is a, let me uh, think up my notes here real quick. Actually, I have all my notes from that class. So Kubernetes, as I mentioned, is a, a container orchestration technology. Um, the uh, uh, orchestration obviously has a, a connotation that it is uh, guiding the process of, of something. And in this case, containers, it's um, uh, shepherding the creation, deletion, um, uh, are there enough containers running of, uh, of a particular uh, product? So let's see here, let's bring in my notes to that. Okay. So as I was starting to get into the most important thing to understand about Kubernetes is, is that it is a rendering engine for YAML templates. Um, it's a very well-featured rendering engine that uh, realizes the things that you ask for in the configuration. Um, but Kubernetes itself consists of a few core pieces of technology. There is a central data store called etcd, where all of these YAML files live. So they're, they're also working on making alternative data stores like uh, CosmoDB, which is like Mongo-ish. Um, it's good, just good enough to know that when you do an interaction with Kubernetes and you edit or create or change something, it is in turn going and changing something in a data store that is nominally etcd. Um, etcd is then uh, referenced by several subsystems of Kubernetes, the API server, the scheduler, the proxy, the controller manager, all of these things are various tasks that aid in realizing what those, uh, those YAML um, uh, 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 recipes are, are doing. Um, on each individual node, there's a, another piece called a kublet that uh, uh, handles talking to the API and, and doing the actual Dockery things that Kubernetes, is, the, the API server or the controller are asking for. Um, as I mentioned briefly on the slide, the core unit of, of work in Kubernetes is a pod. So if I do the kube car, we get pods, all room spaces. I don't know what's running here, so we might have some interesting fun stuff. So each one of these things is a pod, which is one or more containers. Uh, so in this case here, I'm running some stuff in the namespace called Cert Manager. Cert Manager is kind of cool because it automatically creates less encrypt certs for your stuff so that you don't have to uh, uh, deal with that BS yourself. Um, we're running a test of HTTP bin, which if anyone has used that before is a good tool for testing uh, web stuff. Um, Kube system is a Kubernetes um, uh, system namespace where most of the things that are related to what's going on in Kubernetes are run. Um, we're running an Nginx ingress, con ingress controller, which I'll get into what it is in a moment. And then we're running MySQL and WordPress in this cluster as a, like a test. And I'm pretty sure it's been hacked at this point. Uh, who knows? I haven't logged into it in like two or three days. So it's probably already, you know, probably just need to do more of it at this point. Um, each one of these pods were in turn deployed by a thing called a replica set. So a replica set in its basic existence is a YAML file that says, hey, I need this many replicas of that thing running. So in this case here, for instance, uh, we'll say, um, we'll say like Kube proxy, for instance. It, a replica set says, hey, I need to have one copy of this replica running on each node. And so there are three separate copies for my three different nodes that I have running. And so uh, to, uh, to highlight that, kubeco get nodes, I have three nodes running for the past 33 days and racking up uh, my Azure credits for MSDN. Um, so these pods were then in turn generated through replica sets. So if I look at kubeco get replica set, we'll see, oh, let me do all namespaces. That makes more uh, sense. Or, or dash uppercase A. 
So a replica set is, like I said, a, a YAML a representation of the things that you want. We have three columns here, desired, current, and ready. Uh, desired are how many replicas have been asked for. Current is how many replicas are actually running. And ready is how many are actually ready to serve. Um, but to, to step back, we do kukuru get pods again. Let's just look at this MySQL pod. pod MySQL. So in this um, YAML here, so as I mentioned, Kubernetes is just a really good template engine, template rendering engine. This is one of those templates that is uh, in, in etcd right now. And this is saying, run a, uh, a copy of uh, a container named this name, which is auto-generated by the replica set when it deploys in namespace WordPress, and there's a bunch of other stuff here. But we'll see here that we can do things uh, like sending environment variables to containers. In this case here, I'm actually loading the, the password from a secret in Kubernetes rather than passing it as a, like a text field in the file. This says, hey, go look at this secret object in Kubernetes and put that into this environment variable. <clears throat> So if we go further down into this uh, this thing here, we'll see image MySQL. And I'm running five seven fourteen because I needed that for this particular version of WordPress. But this could easily be colon latest, like if you've ever run Docker containers and pulled latest, like the same thing. Yeah, same. Thing. You put a Docker image in there and it does does the needful. Um, the there's some other things in the in the uh, pod here that are relevant. Uh, so there's a mention here of something called liveness probe. Kubernetes can check on a schedule whether or not the thing is running right. So in this case, it's running MySQL admin ping to make sure MySQL is up. If this uh, command exited with a, a, a non-zero exit code, it would kill the pod and bring it back online. There's also a thing called uh, readiness probes, which will check a, um, a URL to make sure that an app is ready. You could have a pod that is alive, but it's just not ready to take traffic yet, and this can be a differentiator. Um, but also in this setup here, we have a bunch of information about the ports. So it's a, the uh, MySQL is running on 33.6 on uh, um, that that port in the container itself. And uh, let's see, is there anything else I want to see? Oh, very specifically, uh, interesting parts here: resources. You can specify how much of the cluster you can use in Kubernetes. A lot of people don't actually specify this. And what, what that means is it's the Wild West and whatever you run in the environment can ask for as much resources as it can. Um, in general, if you, as a best practice, if you are going to use Kubernetes in production, you probably want to find out how much CPU and memory your, your individual pods are going to use and set those so that uh, you don't have uh, the, uh, the, the, the mean neighbor scenario where someone in another namespace is taking all of the clusters the resources because they just fired up a Kafka cluster and like you know everything's going to hell. Question for you on that. Mm -hmm. Is there an RBAC control that you can actually limit and control, especially like in dev? So let's say you have somebody with her and I know that Kubi is going to take up to like the what the 20 rule is it what it is. It uses up 20% of the resource for the pod. Mm -hmm. It's going to be allocated for its operations. So so I can stop one of my developers from turning around and saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to go back in here because I know I can and then take up all the resources available. No. Okay. Uh, this, all of the things in here would be under the purview of the pod resource. So if you gave it pod edit, the user could add it, edit anything in here up to and including things like how much of the resources it can use or where to mount the data store for this pod, which is relevant because if they wanted to um, install some form of malware and put an alternate MySQL database up to to serve from where suddenly they had a root admin or whatever to right. it and weren't, weren't pulling data, they could change where those uh, um, that data was coming from in Kubernetes and you might not be otherwise the wiser of that change. So things like that are kind of like spooky, spooky changes that you need to watch out for. So there's a resource <laughs> limit and quota, I think. Right, those are like cluster level resources that your namespace resources that you can set and think that lets you sets sets a default first of all for the resources and then a, a max I think too. Like I forgot what they're yes. called. Like, 
you can you can specify the resources by namespace that the, the, the namespace is allowed to. Like it's called like, like quota limit or and there's one. Oh, I forgot what, mm -hmm. I forgot what the name of the resource. Yeah, the, the the actual directive is escaping me now, but I'm familiar with the fact that you can do that. There's a there are some other uh, nuances to resources. You can put requests in. When you put requests in, it asks for that as a minimum. There's no limit put here, though, which means that this pod can grow to as big as it wants. You can make a request and a limit and say this this pod needs this much, but never more than this, essentially. Um, so some of the other things here that are a bit more um, advanced, there's a section here called uh, init containers, which is uh, something you can do if you want to uh, um, uh, uh, pre pre set up the environment prior to running your actual pod. Like if you need to edit a particular file in your pod's file system to make make everything work, you can do it in in containers. Um, but uh, the that's a bit more off the uh, path there. Um, but what I what I wanted to get to by showing this pod is is that the um, that's the, the YAML that says make this container. But if we then look at uh, replica set of my SQL, it's going to be that. So that, that something people don't know uh, intuitively is, is that this, this ID right here, this PWNMZ part is randomly generated by the replica set. This piece right here is randomly generated by the deployment. And so we're going to ask for, give me the replica set for MySQL, which is the name of our deployment, and then the random ID that's generated for that deployment. Um, by virtue of us uh, uh, having this replica set, we can then create one or more replicas of the app that matches labels that we specified. So in the pod, one, some of the things we had at the top here were labels. And we had uh, like at MySQL and then pod template hash. And so what this is saying is uh, run, uh, well, in this case here, it says uh, run a uh, this a, a template with this label and run it one copy of it. This selector here is how it keeps track of how many it's currently running. So the replica set here is a copy from this point on the container copy of what was in that pods uh, spec. So essentially the replica set is saying, hey, run this container that uh, um, based on these, this, uh, so <clears throat> let me step back. The template is what's gonna be made in the pod. It has these labels. The match label is saying, I want you to keep track of how many copies of that template are running. We wanna have one running. So. Why this is relevant is that if we then look at this other object, a deployment, and it's uh, MySQL, we can see that the deployment, which is a higher level still, says run a rep one replica with all of this, uh, this uh, the, the, the pods configuration, that containers configuration. Now, I'm sure it's like, uh, holy smokes, this is a lot of random text. But, uh, what I want to show next might help uh, explain why I'm, I'm talking about it in this way. If I do a kube cuddle describe pod MySQL, less on that, uh, we'll see that that pod is in turn controlled by replica set. Then if we look at, we describe the replica set. I can type really. Uh, it is controlled by a deployment, MySQL. So this helps uh, explain the tree of how these objects are related. Uh, deployment says, I want a replica, an, an X number of replicas of this particular container or pod. It then causes a replica set to be generated with the number of replicas that it wants to have. 
And the replica set then is in charge of com communicating to uh, the Kubernetes, well, more specifically, the Kubernetes scheduler sees there's a replica set for this particular pod and says, oh, there needs to be one replica running, but currently there's none, so I'm going to start one up. <clears throat> so we went way into like the, the, the deep end here with this. Um, and unfortunately, it's very hard to start from the 10,000 foot view and work your way down. But to just kind of wrap wrap this into uh, the, the the important TLDR is that there are several things that you will be interacting with in Kubernetes. You'll be making deployments. You might be making stateful sets. You might be making jobs or daemon sets. So deployments are the standard uh, software that you would be deploying, like WordPress here in this case or MySQL. Um, a stateful set is similar to a deployment but it's it's a little special in that Kubernetes will try its darndest to always start up that pod in the exact same way, including making sure it has the same host name every time, making sure it comes up on the same node every time, that it's talking to the same uh, persistent volume mount that it, it has every time. Um, you would use stateful sets for things like I've seen it used for a Hadoop cluster for Elasticsearch. Um, if you were going to run Kafka in Kubernetes, I don't know why you would, but if you were, you would probably want to do it as a stateful set just to save, uh, save yourself some problems. Primarily the fact that the stateful set causes the host name to be the same every time is really good for things like Elasticsearch, because when Elasticsearch cluster comes up with a new name, like a node comes up with a new name, Elasticsearch will be like, oh, hey, it's a brand new node. Let me like reinstall all of the indexes uh, to this box. Um, alternately, there are some other things like jobs, which are spawned by a cron job, which we're used to in, in, uh, in you know, scheduling, uh, scheduling jobs. Um, so we have these these pods, and those pods need to talk. They need to, we need to do networking with them. So we noticed that the, um, the, the um, MySQL pod had a container port of 3306. So if we describe pod MySQL, and I think it should be down towards the bottom here. Where is it? we'll see that it has a port 33 out six. So without any other configuration, that pod doesn't have, uh, other pods don't have the ability to talk to it right now because there's no, um, there's nothing in Kubernetes that says, hey, other things want to talk to this pod. So it's kind of like running a container. If you've ever run a Docker container and not specified dash P to, to expose the ports, uh, it just doesn't actually do anything right now. In this case, 3306 is just the internal container port, and it's not actually doing anything uh, right now. We, in turn, need a thing called a service, uh, which is a surprise, another uh, um, YAML template that specifies the following. So essentially what we've got in the spec so cluster ID is automatically created when you create the service so some of this data you wouldn't actually put into your YAML it's just it's here already the important meat and potatoes here is right in this area here where we're talking about ports and selector so what we're saying here is is that the um, we want to uh, route port 33 out 6 to the target port in the container of MySQL now we can use the name MySQL here because in the pod spec, we gave that port the name of MySQL. I generally don't like to do this with my individual pods. I like to actually just use the port number itself because someone could accidentally copy a template that had like HTTP and the port be 5,000 or 8080 and then nothing works and you're like, well, it's supposed to be on port 80. Why is, you know, it's better to, it's better to be explicit on the port number. Um, and you can also specify the protocol uh, for that. You can do TCP or UDP. You cannot do TCP and UDP in one service definition. That's one thing that they ref flat out refuse to change about Kubernetes in spite of lots of us saying, please let us do them all in one thing. You have to create separate services for TCP versus UDP. Uh, and the important piece here is selector 
app equals MySQL. This is that label that we were talking about before where the replica set says, oh, I need to make sure this many copies of this label is running. By specifying the label in the, de in the deployment and therefore being on the app, app equals MySQL, now the rest of Kubernetes knows how to look up or, or has a way to look up the thing you're looking for. In this case, we're saying app MySQL. This, is, this app is a random thing that you could choose a different name for. This is not a, a Kubernetes construct. It is a freeform field. So you can say, this could easily be at MySQL and n colon development or something like that. You can add as many selectors as you need into this to target exactly the thing that you're wanting to uh, talk to. But with the addition of this uh, service object in the Kubernetes, the uh, kube proxy controller sees this YAML in etcd and goes, oh, I need to make the appropriate IP tables rules on these Linux boxes to enable uh, someone talking at 33 out 6 to, on the box to talk to this Docker container that may or may not be uh, um, on the same port. Without this, that does not, uh, you will not be able to talk to MySQL. Uh, and so one of the things that we can look at if we do a get services, we'll see that MySQL is what's called a typed cluster IP. And this indicates that everything in the MySQL cluster that is permitted to talk to it, and I, I kind of like put an, uh, you know, an asterisk of permitted to talk to it because there is ways to pre prevent pods from talking to each other. Um, Anything that is permitted to talk to it at the cluster level can talk to it at that IP address at port 3306. We have another uh, service here called WordPress. WordPress, the weird naming is because Helm charts will sometimes choose random word names for their, their thing. If you do not specifically tell it the format you want, it'll just say, oh, you're deploying a Helm chart WordPress of name WordPress. And that's why it's WordPress. WordPress. Anyway, in Azure and in AKS or in uh, uh, GK, GKE, EKS, and AKS, when you create a service of type load balancer, it will automatically ask the cloud platform to create a load balancer object for you and then talk to it at a specific port, which is created on the system. This is technically this te is technically called a node port. You can create a service that is just a node port type which would then open a high port on the Kubernetes nodes themselves that you could access the service directly. That's more relevant in bare metal uh, installs where someone might have a, like a hot proxy um, load balancer and they need to talk to a specific port on a different machine. Luckily, since we're talking about Azure, it, it just handles all the, the, the mucky muck about load balancing for us. And so as a result, if you go to this IP address port 80, you will come up to my WordPress site, which may or may not be hacked at this point. Um, but uh, it automatically uh, generates that external IP once the load balancer object is realized. And in Azure, that can take five to 10 minutes for the thing to pop up. So when it is not created, it will sit there with pending as opposed to having an IP address there. Do you get a separate IP for every load balancer you create? Like yes. external IP? Yes, separate. Yeah, that would be cool them, I guess. Well, you 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 would, but there's actually a better way. Better way to do this with only one load balancer. Ingress controller. Ingress controller, right? Uh, so this this particular technology of using a load balancer works good in situations where you have to do NLB, where you're you're trying to load balance TCP connections. Um, but if you need to do straight HTTP, it's easier to use this uh, a concept of an ingress controller. And an ingress controller is a load balancer and uh, deployment in Kubernetes that's special, specifically uh, called out in Kubernetes to say, I want to be the load balancer for the apps inside of Kubernetes. <clears throat> so, in the, in the, so let me uh, show how that works here. Um, I wanted to be in Ingress. Okay, so if I do a kube cuddle get pods, I have the nginx ingress controller running. So there's a there's a um, a controller similar to the controllers we've already talked about, um, 
you know, I, I've, I keep harping on this. Like, there's a, there's a Kubernetes scheduler controller which schedules pods. There's a Kubernetes proxy controller which handles uh, networking. Um, the the um, there's the API server controller which handles uh, uh, communication with the API. Uh, everything in Kubernetes is a controller pattern with a YAML uh, backend. So can't say it enough. Uh, in this case here. Ingress controllers, you bring your own. Similar to how in authentication we bring our own bolt on off, we bring our own ingress controller uh, in this environment. So in this case here, there's a pod running that handles Nginx, uh, well, it's a, it handles ingress requests and it's, it, it's Nginx with proxy pass directives that it dynamically adds uh, as, as you build out the thing. So the default backend, by the way, is just an Nginx. Uh, a web server that just says 404 not found if you try to access the ingress controller and there's nothing there. Um, I think we're using an index ingress controller for uh, the HTTP bin. So let me see here. Okay. All right. So if I do a kube cuddle get ingress. Yeah. So we are currently running HTTP bin on our ingress controller, which means that if you go to this uh, DNS, and I apologize, I use my personal DNS, so I didn't have to worry about uh, um, uh, getting permission to do it with a 10th magnitude uh, DNS name. Um, but if you go to HTTP bin.azk.v6.me, you'll get HTTP bin where you can then do like slash IP to get your IP address and stuff like that. Um, but the, the important thing to show about this ingress controller uh, it's called it is similar to a service definition right? because what it's saying is is that hey ingress controller if you get traffic with this host header and it's meant to go to this path or any other path below it send it to the backend service that exists named HTTP bin on the port HTTP. So if we were to then list the services in the HTTP bin um, namespace, we would see there's a service called HTTP bin that has a port defined called HTTP. So what happens is, is that, that this ingress controller exists. It in turn, uh, when the Nginx ingress controller pod sees there's a change in the ingress controller list in etcd, it goes, oh, I need to create a new load balancer or a new, a new proxy pass directed in my config file for this. It then in turn populates that and rehashes Nginx so that, uh, so that it works. Um, one thing I did mention is, is that this cluster uses cert manager. If you set up cert manager properly, you can use a simple annotation in Kubernetes. An annotation is just something you can add to an individual object in Kubernetes to give it a name of, uh, of some sort. In this case, we're using this uh, TLS Acme true. And what this says is, is that if you access this host at uh, HTTPS 443, and we notice that this secret, this uh, uh, certificate does not exist, it will ask the cert manager in Kubernetes to get Let's Encrypt to make the certificate for you. And then it will then in turn store that certificate into uh, the secret and it will be used for the ingress. So it's it's kind of neat that, that that technology is there uh, because you don't have to worry about creating the certificate yourself if you're in an environment that actually will allow Let's Encrypt certs. Some places think that it's the end of the world, that there are free certs available at a whim. but. Uh, it solves one problem, which is end-to-end -end encryption that uh, is good enough for most of uh, the universe. <clears throat> Let's see here. What other things do I have on my list of stuff? Okay. Um, that is the like 30-minute version of what Kubernetes is slash does. There's a whole lot more nuance that I have not discussed uh, because this is kind of like the bite-sized version of this. Um, I will be happy to entertain any questions, including what did we just hear? <laughs> um, do you have any questions about this? Uh, well, to you know, the real important point is how does this fit into our back, which is the original question you asked, which spawned us onto this. Um, 
So I've given you a whole bunch of different resources like pods, deployments, um, replica sets. The roles and cluster roles in the environment are uh, defined such that you can have various accesses to those things. So if I do kubectl get roles, uh, there are no resources found. And the reason why is there are no roles created in this HTTP bin uh, namespace. But if I say get cluster roles, there's a whole bunch of them. And the ones that Kubernetes uh, uh, ships with have system uh, prefixed on them. There's also a couple that I think Azure add like view. So let's put the heck of it. Let's uh, edit cluster role view and see what it allows. Okay, so this is not actually Azure. It is Cert Manager, it looks like. So, let's see what it does. All right, we'll start at the top here. Uh, so, so, subjects that have this cluster role can look at CRD created. So, CRDs are custom resource definitions. So, you can create your own YAML templates for things in Kubernetes and create them as a cluster resource uh, definition, and it makes a new uh, API group, like I was mentioning uh, early on in the presentation. It defines some custom uh, primitives of certificates and issuers for, for Cert Manager. And so what this RBAC is saying is, is that someone with this cluster role bound to them will be able to get list and watch certificates and issuers, issuers being the settings required for Let's Encrypt to create a certificate for you. Um, we also see that in this view, there's all API groups, so everything. Um, get list and watch for services, service accounts, replication controllers, pods, procedure calls. Okay, so this is looking more and more like it is just a default view cluster role. So if we wanted to give someone read, read access to everything, but sans secrets, that's important. There's no secrets in here. And let's see what else is coming down here at the bottom. So. All right, so you can see things like bindings and some of this other stuff is uh, like being able to look at the logs from a pod. Sometimes when your apps like uh, some bad apps log passwords in their standard app, you probably don't want to let everyone be able to read the logs from your, your things. And moreover, you probably want to restrict access to your log aggregation system for the same reason that they, if you put passwords in logs, it's bad. And especially in situations like PCI environments, they really don't like that. Uh, let's see here, yeah, so it looks like this is all mostly just um, uh, get list and watch for various sub pieces of Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, so as you can see, this is, as I mentioned, a cluster role binding. So if we give a, a user, or rather, I'm sorry, a subject, if we give a subject the view cluster role binding, it means that particular subject can uh, view all of those items that are uh, uh, specified there. Important to note that if you do not have any roles assigned to you, it's default to nine. So you're not given anything. You have to specify all of it. Um, but so there are, as mentioned, cluster role bindings. And those are the, um, the connections between a cluster role and the subject. So if we look at the, let's see, Kuka, edit cluster role binding, we can see here that in this case, everyone that's in the Kubernetes defined system masters uh, have cluster role cluster admin. Now, this is, this is something that I've tried to um, figure out on my own, was how to add more things to system masters. Uh, it's not something that you normally have to do because it's usually just that admin account that uh, is necessary to do the initial part. But this is kind of a, a nebulous name for uh, the admin of the box. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. So, oh, no, that's not going to work. Kubectl edit cluster binding to it. So I mentioned briefly something about uh, Helm, which is uh, uh, 
package manager for Kubernetes. It's a kind of an oversimplification for what it does. But Helm uses a, uh, a pod called Tiller to do the deployment steps. And so as a result, the Tiller service account needs to have a lot of access as it creates de deployments, pods, services, et cetera. So it needs to have almost the keys of the kingdom, but not quite. Um, I've given it keys to the kingdom though, because I hate security and I'm going to be hacked sometime. Um, yeah, but as you can see here, there's a bunch of these uh, controller RBAC or cluster role bindings. That kind of gives you an idea of all of the uh, of the controllers that are in Kubernetes that handle realizing those configs that we've been talking about so heavily. Um, each one of these things need to have specific uh, permissions, and so you could look at those to uh, to base your own um, settings in. I'm actually kind of curious as to why AWS Cloud Provider is used on the AKS cluster, but my guess is is that it comes baked into Kubernetes. Um, yeah, so I guess the you know again I'm repeating myself with the TLDR, but um, there are lots of different resources. So the command I just ran was kubectl API dash resources. It's not very well documented, um, but if you get and want to see a list of all of the different types of things people might need to access you can use the API resources command to get a list of all of those. So each one of these names here are resources you can specify, uh, as long as you also specify the API group if it has it, for uh, various items of RBAC. Um, but Kubernetes does have a lot of extra things that I haven't talked about, like pod security policies, which uh, control whether or not one pod can access another pod. Uh, network policies where, in general, can uh, parts of the Kubernetes internal cluster talk to each other. Uh, pod disruption budgets, where you're okay if you lose two pods, but if you lose three, it's the end of the world. Like, that's that's where you specify that kind of thing. Um, there's also some other neat stuff, like at the top here, horizontal pod autoscalers, which are, are a really cool piece of Kubernetes that don't quite work as well as you'd hope yet, but they're getting better. With horizontal pod autoscalers, you can query the monitoring system to see how loaded a pod is, and if it's too loaded, it will start another copy of the pod. Uh, I actually used this technology at a previous employer where we did batch uh, record processing, and if we suddenly had 50,000 things we needed to do, we needed to split, split out more workers, it would detect that in our, our monitoring system there was 50,000 queue entries to process, and it would go and spin up a whole bunch of pods to handle it, which is kind of cool. So Kubernetes does have a lot of extra neat things in it that uh, you just kind of run into in happenstance when you're using it, or if you do things like take the uh, certified Kubernetes administrator uh, certification, which requires you to build a Kubernetes cluster by hand without any of the fun tools that we use to do it, which is, it's a fun, it's a fun uh, uh, certificate to track for it. Um, okay, I know we're getting kind of later in the evening, so I don't know how much further you guys want me to go. Do you think that I've somewhat no, you're, you're good. It was just more of a question of the visualization of understanding what you were talking about, what you had on display, mm -hmm. and how that correlates to basically to the environment. It is kind of hard because it's a lot of it's text-based. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of it's just yeah, just that. Yeah, it's it's a lot of it's, we. Uh, so in the school of SRE, the first the first course was about Terraform, and the second course was about Kubernetes, and then it was. And they use Terraform to build Kubernetes because it's just easier to do it that way. Uh, a lot of this stuff is is like a 10,000 foot view of all the things that it does is kind of not enough, but then there's no middle step of it. It's like you're just you're already into the the nasty uh, uh, nitty gritty items uh, once you get too much further further down. Um, any other questions? Um. Some question the school of SRE is it available online? Do you like have like non magnitude members? It is currently on just our company's uh, stream channel. Okay. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it wouldn't be made public at some point. The only thing is, is that sometimes we do talk about client specific things. 
So if there was a video that I was talking about something that was client specific, we might not be able to share that one. Makes sense. I pure that or without some kind of mute. Right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, blurring out the screen yeah. like a scissor. <laughs> no, the uh, a lot of the stuff is pretty uh, is pretty generic, and uh, I could definitely talk to Casey. Casey's the guy who who would okay that to see whether or not we could make those public. But uh, this video is definitely going into the school of SRE uh, list here because there were several people who were like, "What is?" Kubernetes are back, so hopefully this gets into enough of the nitty gritty there, uh, so that uh, everyone else gets. Uh, the school is a, is a online school. Or? Uh, so what happens is is that we have a Teams meeting once a week, uh -huh. and I just talk until I can't talk anymore, or time runs out, essentially <laughs> on a particular topic. People, it's very easy to get me rambling on things. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's how that works out usually. Is hey Pete, how do you do this? Well, gather around. What's some story? <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much uh, for attending and, and all that. And if you have any questions, oh, I had a, a slide up with my, my email address, but I'm Pete Grace at tedmagazine.com. Feel free to shoot me any emails if you have questions. Kubernetes, I can definitely feel them. All right. No worries. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.